Our story begins on the 2nd of October 2018, an Air Astana Embraer 190 was due for some major maintenance and so it was being ferried to the military airbase of Alverca in Portugal. They had some complex service bulletins to go through. They had to do some basic inspections, remove and check the avionics and a lot of things like that. On the 9th of October, they started work on the wings of the plane. The control cables that controlled the ailerons needed some work as there was too much friction. Ailerons are small control surfaces on the trailing edge of the wing and it helps the plane to bank. They swapped out the stainless steel cables for cables made with carbon steel. They also did some general maintenance on the plane, greased a few pulleys, adjusted a few things, that sort of stuff. On the 26th of October, the fixes were done and the plane was powered on, but there was an issue. On the engine indicating and crew alerting system, or ICAS, was an error. The error read, FLT, CTR, no dispatch. The computer was telling the mechanics that the plane was not ready for dispatch, as there was something wrong with the flight control system. They carried on with the other tests that they needed to carry out before the plane was to be delivered back to Air Astana. So they carried out their inspections and they did a few engine run-up tests. The plane was delivered by the maintenance team to the area manager, but the error on the ICAS system was still there. Something in the flight control system needed fixing. The manager put together a small team to try and find the issue and to fix it. They didn't have much time. The plane was to be back with Air Astana on the 24th, and they had extended that by a few days to the 31st of October. But their troubleshooting went well past that deadline. On the 11th of November, the plane was to be flown back to Minsk from the Alverca Air Base. The flight crew went over the airplane to see if all was in order. The flight crew found an issue with the ventilation and the avionics system and a small glitch with the hydraulic system. This was fixed by the maintenance crew and they taxied out to the runway to begin their flight to Minsk. The plane had six occupants, including the three pilots. It was a rainy day and clouds were low to the ground. There was a layer of clouds at 500 feet and then another layer at 1500 feet. The Embraer took off into the skies at 1.31 p.m. Right after the takeoff, the pilot flying had a hard time engaging the autopilot. It just would not engage. Moreover, the plane started oscillating side to side very slowly, but these oscillations soon started to build up. The pilots knew that something was very wrong. They tried to activate the autopilot many times, but they kept getting an autopilot fail error. Right after takeoff, they declared an emergency. They knew that they needed to get this plane back on the ground and they needed to do it fast. The plane was executing uncommanded roll and yaw inputs. Realizing that they had little to no control of their plane, they began to troubleshoot their aircraft. The plane just would not behave in the way that they expected it to. Things were so bad that the crew asked Lisbon Control for a heading out to sea where they could attempt a ditching in an attempt to minimize damage should they lose the little control of the plane that they had. The situation was so dire that the pilots had a very hard time flying in the general direction of the sea. At this point, the pilots needed a plan. The pilots consulted with the technicians on board to see if they could offer some advice. The crew had been switching between the direct and normal modes of the flight control system, and they found that they had a bit more control in the direct mode. In the direct mode, the flight control module is removed from the control surface control chain. Now, the deflection of the control surfaces are proportional to the inputs made on the yoke. The trial and error in the sky continued. They looked at how the ailerons moved from the windows of the plane and compared it to the control inputs. The end result was nothing like what they expected. For all intents and purposes, they did not have aileron control, and the pilots had to relearn to fly this plane with throttle inputs and rudder inputs. As they flew east, they encountered some better weather. They now started to fly south to attempt a very risky landing. They still had very little control. Flight 1388 was joined by two Portuguese F-16s, and they guided the plane towards the airport of Beja. They made their first approach to runway 19 right of Beja, and they could not keep the plane under control, and they went around. The pilot who had been flying the plane for the past few hours at this point was so exhausted that he swapped seats with the first officer. They came in for a second attempt, but that didn't work either. They had to go around again. On the third try, they were able to put the plane down safely more than two hours after their ordeal began. This account doesn't really do the pilots of Flight 1388 justice. I'd like to get into the specifics of what they did during the flight, but the report just does not go into that granular data. But these pilots did do a fantastic job of getting their plane down safely. 
First off, when they realized that they did not have control of their plane, they were in IMC or instrument meteorological conditions. The weather was bad and they did not have a lot of visual references to orient themselves. It would have been very easy for them to lose control of the plane, but they did not. Even after they got some better weather, they were still fighting the plane. The plane was still very unstable. To get an idea for what they went through, all you have to do is look at the FDR data readout. Their vertical speed was all over the place. At times, they were climbing at 16,000 feet per minute, and at other times, they were descending at 20,000 feet per minute. That's more of a dive than a descent, to be honest. All through this, they were fighting the plane, and they were fighting to keep the plane under control, and that wasn't easy. The maneuvers that they pulled off in the stricken airplane taxed them greatly. They were pulling 5 Gs at times. 5 G is the maximum that the average person can handle, and they didn't do that once over the course of their two-hour ordeal. They had to recover their plane multiple times, and they pulled some serious Gs quite a few times. To get a sense for how violent this flight was, all you have to do is look at the aft section of the plane. Most of the aft section of the plane experienced stresses up to 120% of what they were designed for, and other parts went up to 150%. In addition to that, the engines were slightly damaged and the flaps were damaged. The aircraft was permanently deformed. The forces were so great that the underlying structure was damaged. Quoting from an interview with the pilots, VMC was finally discovered at 18,000 feet, but a frightening plunge had the aircraft in a near vertical descent, the altimeter unwinding so fast that it was unreadable. Airspeed was in excess of 350 knots IAS, loud aerodynamic noise, and as they pulled out as firmly as they dared, over the strident calls from the GPWS, a creaking sound from the airplane, end quote. This quote gives us an idea as to what the crew had to deal with. For their amazing flying, the pilots were awarded with the Kermetti Aviator Medal. With the plane on the ground safely, it wasn't hard for investigators to find the source of their control problems. The ailerons on the plane were driven by pulleys, and the pulleys were connected to the ailerons themselves via cables. The cables on the accident airplane were reversed, which meant that the ailerons were moving in the opposite direction of the direction that they were supposed to move in. So how could the plane take off with its aileron cables inverted? The plane had just been maintained, so the investigators decided to look at the maintenance records to see what happened. The work on the wing needed the pulleys of the wing to be disconnected, and so they disconnected both control cables. After the structural work on the wing was done, they temporarily reconnected the cables. The temporary reconnections were done by personnel without relevant experience. They found it hard to follow the instructions given by the manufacturer, and the figures given were quite complex. The investigators also found some inconsistencies here. According to the documentation, this work was done on the 17th of October. But on the 17th of October, the plane was not in a state where this work could be done. After this, the cables were replaced with carbon steel cables. The cables were replaced one by one, and they followed the temporarily installed cables. Since the temporarily installed cables were inverted, the permanent installation was also inverted, and they followed the temporary cables. In essence, they used it as a guide. When the plane was powered on, the flight control system gave them an FLT no-dispatch error. To fix this issue, they started to troubleshoot the airplane from the 5th of November. A technical representative located in Amsterdam was sent to help them fix the airplane. During the troubleshooting of the plane, they found many other issues with the airplane, and those were fixed. In total, they did six power-on and power-up sequences, and the return-to-service procedure was done on the flight control system, and the error was gone, but the inverted cables were not found. To make the error go away, you had to wipe the data of the flight control module, where the fault was stored. It is quite surprising that no one caught the inverted ailerons, even during the extended period of testing. The investigators also found that the documentation provided by the aircraft manufacturer was not as clear as it could be. It was very hard for the maintenance personnel to understand the figures given. The complexity of the figure and the documentation definitely played a role in the cables getting reversed. Over the course of the plane's repair, there were multiple opportunities to find issues with the ailerons, but the issue was not spotted. The flaw lay dormant till they took off. Another issue was the plane's design itself. The design allowed for the cables to be reversed. A good design would have made it impossible for the cables to be reversed. Now you might be wondering why the crew just didn't use opposite inputs to go where they wanted to. The Embraer 190 has roll spoilers in addition to ailerons.
The roll spoilers pop up from the top of the wing and it increases the drag on one wing, helping the plane to turn. But on flight 1388, the roll spoilers were working just fine. So the ailerons were inverted and the ailerons and the roll spoilers were acting against each other instead of working together. This made the plane very unstable. In the end, the cause for this incident was easy enough to understand. The aileron cables got mixed up, but the environment that allowed that to happen is a lot more complicated. There was very little oversight and there weren't procedures in place to detect maintenance missteps. The maintenance teams were not organized by skill, which meant that people who were not experienced enough ended up working on the wing of the plane. The design of the plane allowed for the cables to get reversed in the first place. Then we have the documentation of the plane, which itself was quite hard to understand. Couple that with inexperienced maintenance personnel, you now have the perfect conditions for something like this to happen. The last line of defense was the crew themselves. They should have found the issue during the pre-flight checklist, but they also missed it. This incident could have been a lot worse, but the skills and the teamwork of the crew made sure that the plane came back in for a safe landing. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. A big thank you to Russ Potter and My Lost Airplane Fan for letting me use their amazing footage on my video. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.